Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. There's an extraordinarily common medical condition out there that affects millions of Americans, mostly women. It brings them high levels of disability, discomfort, and lost productivity, but very seldom will you hear them talk about it. They often suffer in silence, fearful of ridicule or embarrassment, sometimes to the point of not leaving their homes. It's not breast cancer, it's not heart disease, and it's not depression. It's incontinence. The loss of bladder control and about 25 million Americans have experienced it. If only grandmothers come to mind, that's not exactly accurate. Recent study results printed in the Archives of Internal Medicine found that yes, 55% of the women in the study that were in their 80s had urinary incontinence. But it might surprise you to learn that 28% of the women in their 30s experience some loss of bladder control at least once a month. Put it all together and you'll find that approximately 50% of American women have experienced incontinence resulting in more than $26 billion a year in direct costs and lost productivity. It's important to point out that incontinence is a symptom, not a disease, and it has a wide variety of causes, which I'll explain in a moment. Also, there are several different types of incontinence, with the most common being stress incontinence. This is urine leakage when any physical pressure is placed on the bladder, such as sneezing or coughing or exercising. Many think incontinence is a life-altering condition, but the truth is the majority of incontinence conditions can be improved or cured with treatment. But in order to get treatment, you have to take the first step, talk openly and honestly with your healthcare professional. Now, in order to understand why incontinence is so common in women, let's first take a step back and talk about the bladder. As with the heart, the bladder is a hollow organ constructed of muscles designed to propel fluid outward. This fluid, urine, is brought from the kidneys to the bladder via two tubes called ureters. The amount of urine carried is a function of the fluid intake. The bladder is a sophisticated organ. It's expected on the one hand to be able to relax enough to serve as an adequate reservoir for urine collection, while on the other hand, it also must be able to contract in order to efficiently empty when it's supposed to. If it doesn't relax completely, it can only hold small amounts of urine and frequent urination is the result. If it doesn't contract completely, the bladder fails to release all the urine it holds. This is a problem because with less emptying, there's less room for more urine that arrives from above. And once again, frequent urination is the result. To make matters worse, when the bladder does not empty completely, the stagnant urine is more likely to become infected. Infection makes the bladder wall irritable and less likely to relax and be able to hold an adequate amount of urine. All of this relaxing and contracting must be in conjunction with the voluntarily controlled sphincter muscles that surround the urethra, the tube that empties the bladder. The sphincter muscle must relax as the bladder muscles contract in order for urine to flow easily outward. When the sphincter muscle contracts, it squeezes the urethral tube and it prevents urine flow. Basically, women are more susceptible to incontinence because of their anatomy. A woman's urethra is much shorter than a man's, so it offers less resistance to outflow when the bladder muscle contracts. Also in women, the urethra sits at the upper wall of the vagina, and it is relatively easy for bacteria in the vagina to find their way into the urethra and into the bladder and cause a urinary tract infection. The bladder, urethra, and sphincter muscle are all directly contiguous with the woman's uterus, vagina, and pelvic musculature. Therefore, women who deliver babies vaginally have an increased risk of incontinence, around 17% compared to non-childbearing women. How does this happen? Vaginal delivery can stretch pelvic muscles, allowing abdominal organs and the bladder to push downward. This causes the already short urethra to telescope upon itself. 
and it becomes shorter still, offering even less resistance to urine flow. In addition, in some births, the urinary sphincter muscle and the urethra can be traumatized. Weight can have the same effect on the urinary system as childbirth. In the study I mentioned earlier, women with a body mass index, BMI, of greater than 30 were 139% more likely to be incontinent than those with a normal weight range. Due to the fact that the bladder and the sphincter muscle are nerve dependent, any metabolic conditions like diabetes or depression or neurological degenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis can injure the nerves of the bladder and urethra and increase the risk of incontinence. And finally, as you might expect, problems with incontinence increase linearly with age in women. In the late years, it can become a serious enough management problem that it can trip a woman from independence to dependence. In fact, half of all nursing home patients are incontinent, and dependency doesn't come cheap. Adding a single month of independence and health to America's senior population would save $5 billion. With a 10% decrease in hospitalization and institutionalization, $50 billion in savings per year would accrue. What to do? First, as a woman, understand that bladder care is essential. If you have pain, frequency, or leakage, don't suffer in silence. Be evaluated thoroughly. Second, for caregivers, Routine questioning and screening for incontinence in women is crucial, especially among those who have had children or hysterectomies, are depressed or overweight, or are diabetic or have neurological problems. In her lifetime, a woman's bladder will be asked to relax and contract with perfection 300,000 to 400,000 times. We can't expect that type of performance unless we take better care of this remarkable organ. For Health Politics, I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. If you're accessing Health Politics with a portable device, please visit our homepage, healthpolitics.org, for more information on this topic and many others. If you're watching Health Politics on the internet, please visit the links below for additional information. Download the transcript and slides to share with friends or colleagues or use the discussion guide to help generate conversations in the classroom. If you are not yet a Health Politics subscriber and would like to begin receiving a weekly email to keep you up to date on our latest programs, please click on Subscribe to Health Politics above and enter your email address. Again, thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee.